Hi, everyone. So how do you know what's real? Does that seem like a pretty obvious question? And given the title of my talk, do you think I'm just going to say science? Well, I would argue that it's less important to know all the facts than it is to be able to share ideas. The facts will come along with that process. And in order to ignite a movement a scientific idea sharing, millions of others and I decided to march for science. But I was often asked the question, why would you march for science? I had to think a lot about this because it was a good question. What can a march for science bring us? Marching for social issues makes more immediate sense because of the direct impact that social problems have on people's lives. Scientists themselves worried that this march might politicize science, but here's the thing. Science has never really been free from politicization because of the power it provides. One of our first champions of evidence-based reason, Galileo, was himself a victim of political suppression. He was sharing ideas of the universe that the reigning power saw threatening at the time. and He was punished dearly for it. Controlling our perceptions of reality is very convenient for political groups to manipulate our opinions in order to achieve their agenda. In fact, if you can think of any oppressive political regime or social structure in history, you can always find some manipulation of facts within it. And if you need to ask yourself who has the power, just answer the question, who controls the knowledge? The only way to resist this gradual creep of mass delusion is to be properly armed with tools to figure out nonsense. We could be headed off a metaphorical cliff whether we choose to believe in it or not. And science provides us an efficient method of discovering facts in order to learn how to avoid the cliff, but it doesn't necessarily help us with that essential component of communicating the facts so that everyone can avoid the cliff. The most powerful tools we can imagine are meaningless if no one knows how to use them. Those same tools could be weapons, if only a few know how to use them. You want an example? Do any of you know how to code with computers? So not only is it good to advocate for science, it's morally necessary for a well-functioning society. And yet, we shy away from these conversations. Because somewhere on the, along the progression of the internet, more people than ever have wrapped up their understanding of the world into their personal identities. Verifying evidence on the internet is actually extremely difficult because you can find false or conflicting information about anything to verify your preconceived notions. Finding company who never challenge your beliefs is also easy online, and tribalism is rampant. You can imagine your real community with a diversity of opinions, A, B, D, all going onto the internet and segregating into similar opinions and digital communities. As an older millennial, I grew up watching these dynamics develop, getting my first computer in middle school and having my first conversations online shortly after. And it turns out for most of my life, I was not good at this. I came from blue collar roots, and I can't say that understanding the world was a major topic of conversation in my family growing up. Like most families, it just didn't make sense to do because getting by and enjoying what we had in front of us was most important. My parents got their nightly news from the television, and that was enough. I was lucky that they encouraged my passions. They exposed me to science as a kid, and I took it in like a sponge. Zoos, museums, magic school bus, discovery world. I remember growing up thinking, this was the good stuff that everyone would want to know. I mean, why wouldn't they? As we speak, as we speak, stars are exploding and their guts are being condensed into planets containing the elements that make up your bodies, your very bodies. Oh, just happened again. As you can tell, science education became a huge passion for me. And I spent a lot of time in college doing science education, and then I learned a lot about sharing facts. But if I'm being honest with you, I never got much beyond simply sharing the facts. Direct education is extremely important, but it only reaches those who are interested in listening to you. I never ask questions about why people should listen to me or what I could learn from them. Even coming from a family who doesn't have too much of a scientific background, I didn't think too much about how someone might perceive someone telling them what should be important to them. So when I would chime in with something like, well, actually, 
I shouldn't have been surprised when my comments weren't exactly appreciated. As an adult, I saw my own lecture and attitude clash with my family during those classic social media comments and dinner table conversations. We've all had that Thanksgiving. To this day, I have a family member who grew up two doors away from me, who helped raise me, who fed me biscuits and gravy on Saturday mornings, who probably wouldn't talk to me today because of words I've used to them. I'll forever regret saying, you don't know what you're talking about to someone that I loved. Because what really happened is we didn't know how to talk with each other. I didn't get too much of this reality check in academia either. I spent eight years in research institutions, during my master's degree and afterwards as a research specialist. And I was hard pressed to find people who disagreed with me on any of the hot button scientific issues. I mean, sure, the science community argues over various hypotheses and the interpretation of results, but overall, people in scientific circles share similar values and take for granted the process of knowing what's real. We just share the facts and hope people appreciate them because we've done the work and they haven't. Let's also be frank. Feeling like you have all the answers can make you unwilling to engage with someone who's challenging you that you think knows less than you. Maybe you don't think it's worth your time. It's important for me to say there, there are those in academia who are actively challenging this communication issue. In fact, I think we could learn a lot from people who study culture and communication. But let's recap the state of things. The science community has a communication challenge in front of us. We want to discuss reality, but aren't effectively doing so outside of the choir. Then you have those who don't have time or aren't interested in communicating at all. And finally, there are those who have political motives to the way they treat scientific facts. As societal rifts grew and grew through the echo chambers of the internet over the last presidential election, something just felt necessary about this moment to finally say enough is enough. We need to re-energize the public conversation about science that we saw when we landed people on the moon. Because if we lose those fundamental principles of knowing that our founding fathers valued so highly, we lose our foundation of democracy. The science community may not have caused this problem, but we're going to need to seriously reevaluate our approach if we're going to help solve it. This is why it was time to march for science. With the fire of all these thoughts in my mind, I joined the March for Science organization team in Milwaukee. <laughs> I found them online, actually. I was excited to see that they were hoping to tackle these very issues that I'd been struggling with. And we had a lot of conversations about what a March for Science would look like. Whether we realized it or not, we decided to implement ideas that scholars of communication have known about for a long time. We weren't going to tell people what to think or why our way was better. We were simply going to welcome everyone to celebrate science and encourage people from all backgrounds to find a piece of science that belongs to them. Something we can agree upon as a starting point to get our conversations going again. This would be a welcoming celebration because we all stand to benefit from scientific achievements. Knowledge is empowering, and we can all unite around that fact. We had no enemies. We weren't against any institution. We sought to be the movement of pro. We just wanted to stand together, be nerds, and get excited about science. And we had a few approaches to achieve these goals. We wrote articles to feature local scientists to try and break through the jargon and make their work more approachable. We invited speakers to the march from a diverse background of life experiences in science to allow the public to better relate with them, to show that scientists are part of our community. They're our neighbors. And since many of them are paid with tax dollars, they serve the public, and their work contributes towards the greater good. We also strategized ways we could bring people from every ideological background into the fold and reach out to those who might see us as threatening. We networked with the outer suburbs and the inner cities. We made a painstaking effort for inclusivity, to make a political statement without having a partisan one. In our messaging, we made clear that partisan identities are irrelevant to the fact that science moves this planet forward. It's all around us. It's this. It's everything that you can look at in this room right now. There are scientific achievements everywhere. And finally, we had a policy not to shy away from people who challenged us. In doing this, I learned a lot about navigating these conversations, and 
was one of my most reflective experiences. We had one particular challenger leading up to the march that I'll call Tim, and Tim was not happy with us. He used some colorful language on social media chat to let us know. Tim made clear that he saw what we were doing as threatening what he believed in. We thought about ignoring Tim, but we decided to engage him. We asked questions like, okay, why are you feeling that way? What matters to you? And how can we address your concerns? We wanted to let him know that not only did we have nothing against him, we wanted to welcome him to the march and try to find something we both agreed upon in science that we could celebrate together. I don't think he expected that. He stopped replying after too long. But then on the day of the march, there was Tim. He approached our team as the guy we'd been interacting with on social media and he told us, I really do support science. I just thought you'd be biased. Thanks for not being biased. Tim marched alongside us and thousands of other people that day. For him, at least, a common denominator was found between Tim and a bunch of nerds he'd have no interest in speaking to otherwise. And I get what you're thinking right now. It may seem a little unbelievable, but this really did happen. But no, 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 no. This is not the magic bullet to solve all of society's problems. It's true. Some people will never talk to you. And plenty of people didn't. But by at least leaving the table open, we engaged more people than we would have ever otherwise. We wouldn't have reached him if we didn't try. Through continuing that effort, we can pull the average of society towards more reasonable and approachable discourse. More people interested in discussing facts. We founded the Milwaukee Area Science Advocates to be that continuing force, to help keep these important conversations about science alive and well. And we've drawn some lessons for ourselves from the march and for the science movement as we continue forward. The most important lesson is not for those who have unscientific beliefs. It's for people like me, who are interested in sharing scientific ideas. Most critical is that the science community has to start getting themselves out there. You have to. And have the difficult conversations with the public. Not just at the annual symposium or the usual science venues, but at the local town hall, in the newspaper, with elected officials and just out with your neighbors and the community. I know it's tough, I know. It's a thick barrier to break and it may not always end well. And maybe you don't think it's your job to be your own advocate. But in a society where the public appreciation of science is dwindling, those who think it's not their job may soon be out of one. They don't speak out. And we need you, so please, get out into the public, share your ideas. And when you do this, it must be done with compassion. The scientific process doesn't have a heart, but scientists have a heart. So science communication needs a heart. We have to have the humility that none of us are above taking the time to truly understand someone who disagrees with us. Let's give less lectures and ask more questions. Let's always have something to learn. What matters to them as a person? What are they perceiving about me or what am I perceiving about them that could be totally wrong? Remember that no one is their list of facts and beliefs. Ideas exist outside of an individual. And you might be right, but you can be right in the wrong ways. Avoid ignorant straw mans and leave the insults at home. That gets us nowhere. Alan Watts said, if a person believes the earth is flat, you're not going to talk him out of that. He can look out the window and see that it's flat. The only way you're going to convince him that it isn't is to say, OK, let's go and find the edge. So practice something that I've learned is called steel manning. You heard of this? Instead of the classic straw man, where you mischaracterize an argument in order to make it easy to win, maybe you talk past each other, maybe you make things up, but you don't realize you're making things up, try to form the best version, the most reasonable version of an argument you disagree with. State it back to the person you disagree with and see if they agree with your summary of their idea. If not, ask genuine questions. Try to get it right in their eyes. See how well your ideas hold up against that version. It's crazy, but you might even find you were wrong. And why should we do this? We need to find ways to have discussions without assuming bad intentions and work through disagreements with a spirit of goodwill. Or how are we going to mend these rifts? We have to talk to each other. So how do you know what's real? You don't, really. We only have tools to discover what's true and methods of communicating what we've learned. We can make that joint discovery beautiful 
instead of uncomfortable. Because science is humbling. It exposes us to what we don't know. It makes idiots of us all. Being comfortable with that fact can be our depolarizer and our unifying force as we join together towards further knowing. This needs to be the movement of science. So let's find the edge together. Thank you.